Hi, I'm Misty Copeland, principal dancer with the American Ballet Theater. I am so beyond thrilled to be here talking to one of the world's most groundbreaking dancers and choreographers from South Africa, Dada Masilo. Now what's fascinating about Dada to me is that we have both worked on classic pieces such as Swan Lake and Giselle, but our productions and backgrounds could not be more opposite. I'm just so completely honored, Dada. Oh um, <laughs> I'm a fan of your work and I'm so proud of you. Let's start from the beginning. Yes. Because I yes. think it's important for people um, who maybe don't know your story or that do to really get a sense of who you are. Um, so I was born on the 21st of February in 1985 in Soweto, brought up mostly by my grandmother. And, you know, I fell in love with dancing because I, I needed something to do after school. So it started off being a hobby um, and then I just fell in love with it. And it's strange because I was um, very introverted as a kid. But I think that when I started dancing, I knew that I loved performing and I, I, I just I just want to be on stage. A lot of artists, I think, are, are similar in using dance as um, an escape or a way of finding their voice. And so I definitely had a very similar experience as you. I started formal dance training at the age of 12 at a place called the Dance Factory in Johannesburg under the direction of a woman called um, Suzette Lesseau. That's when I started ballet, contemporary, creative movement, improvisation. And what I really, really love about formal dance training is the fact that you've got a structure. You know, you have to learn discipline, you have to learn focus, you have to learn how to eat properly. All of that was really foreign to me. I didn't have any of that growing up and I think that, I think a lot of human beings and children like crave that you know as much as it you would think like no child wants to be disciplined but i really think that if you don't have it in any area of your life you just feel such chaos education is key i remember when i was at school i really struggled with english because I went to a township school first, and so the shock of having to learn everything in English was just crazy. I and mean, I think it's very important for dancers to be able to speak. I love hearing that. And I, I feel like when you're ignorant to certain things, education is such a scary thing. Yeah. And so I think that's just like the easiest way to like put it. I, I really enjoyed my teenagehood because I was actually always in the studio. So I didn't have much else to do. But I think that what is also very interesting um, about my journey as a dancer is that it was only at the age of 20 that Suzette told me that my physiotherapist said that um, I was not gonna dance. I have bow legs, I have broad shoulders, I have funky feet and knees, you know, but because I was so passionate, that is what drove me. So I never, I never thought there was anything wrong with my body. I just thought my legs were a bit off. <laughs> <laughs> that is so amazing. Like, I, I think that that should be celebrated more. Like, the more you talk yeah. about those things, I think that it just does the dance world such a service because whether it's said or not, it's so ingrained in the ballet culture that, you know, you have yeah. to fit into a certain mold. So to see, yeah. um, to see you push through that and just think like, there's nothing wrong with me, I think it's... <laughs> what, what are we going on about? <laughs> Funny story, when I was, I think it was grade 10 or something, the school was putting on Giselle. And I had always hated this whole thing of gelling my hair back and then having a fake bun and putting it there. So then I thought, okay, I'll make it easier for everybody. I'll just shave my hair off. And then I was kicked out of the ballet because, you know, aesthetically it doesn't work. So. Yeah. What were your feelings internally about that? Like, did you think twice about it? I just thought it would be easier. Um, but, you know, and then also I have to powder my arms and it's just, it was, for me, I just didn't understand it. Um, and yeah. It's yeah. so fascinating hearing you talk about this and to hear the way you were affected or not affected mm. by something that affects so many people. It's just mm. really interesting. You're a very special person. And I think that it's oh, amazing how you. <laughs> how you've, you know, interpreted things and not internalized certain things or let them affect you. And then, you know, you have this experience that clearly didn't, I mean, I guess have a big impact on you in terms of limiting you to what you thought you were capable of doing or the spaces you could exist in. Most people having had that experience, you know, whether it's 
being kicked out because you you didn't have the you couldn't style your hair a certain way yeah. or you know having to powder your skin i think most people would have yeah. been like i will never associate myself with those ballets again and yet you created mm -hmm. your own version yes <laughs> i kind of did stumble into choreography that was definitely not what i wanted to do but there were no choreographers that were making the kind of work that i want to make which is narrative based so i thought okay fine uh, if that's the kind of work that you want to do you have to make it yourself but i am a dancer first um choreography is a lot of work <laughs> it's a lot of work did you ever dance swan lake or giselle growing up were those ballets that were my own <laughs> your own but you never experienced the traditional classical versions of of those ballets like dancing them no no i haven't swan lake is the first ballet that i saw when i started dancing and i i think it was a care of and i just thought oh my god this is so beautiful and of course in love with tutus um and tchaikovsky so then uh, when i choreographed swan lake i had this um vision of fusing classical ballet and african dance so because i wanted them to coexist and in the beginning i thought oh okay i'm towing the line here um but with actually working more on it it just felt like african dance and tchaikovsky just worked so well who would have thought you know who would have thought <laughs> what i try not to do is to limit myself i don't like being in boxes I think that I'd like to just open up my mind and see what I can or cannot do. And I mean there's no guarantee that um things are going to work. No, what's one lake I definitely thought I was going to fall flat on its face. It's a different yeah. responsibility. It's a responsibility for other yeah. people as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean there is a th such a thing as choreographer's block. Um there are days when you walk into the studio and you just go it's not working. But I think over the years I have started to to accept and acknowledge it's not a good day go home think about it and then come back because the bashing of something when you can feel that it's not true or that it's not working is just yeah it's pointless really That's amazing and I think that it's something that um the ballet culture could definitely benefit from that type of thought even when it comes to a dancer and our bodies and that some days like you're it, you're just not going to get the best product and you're not going to be put in putting in quality work depending on the condition of your body or even emotional and mental state yeah. and I, and it's yeah. and it's it's great to hear that you as a leader you know are conducting this type of leadership and behavior in the studio i think it's such a positive yeah. thing for the dance community mm. i'm very curious about the fact that you're a professional um principal dancer you work full days how many hours do you yes. work a day 10:15 a.m. until 7 p.m. So, um oh we'll God. have yeah, we have ballet class every morning from 10:15 to 11:45 and then we get a 15 minute break and for a lot of the dancers in the company like for my 20 year career at ABT pretty much it's wow. been consistent that I'm usually in most of the pieces so I don't get lunch breaks so they'll pay you overtime for that moment of that hour however long so I've spent the majority of my career dancing straight through rehearsing from 12 noon to 7 p.m. Oh my god. It's extremely brutal and that's just rehearsal days then you have the yeah. performance season the performances, where yeah. we're in the theater from from 10:15 to about 5:30 and then the show starts at 7:30. So you're <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot. So, I mean, when again, you know, thinking about um your amazing combination of different experiences and dance styles, um would you say that you just kind of stumbled into the style that you've created? In the beginning, I was very clear uh or it was very clear to me that I I didn't want a signature. Mm. I know I love to dance fast, but I wanted to challenge myself a lot more um and when you have a signature you kind of get stuck so then i started doing this fusion thing of fusing different dance techniques because it creates a different dynamic um because it's fresh um and just also because i don't want to be complacent um i really want to always be pushing myself and learning new things i've been dancing to swan lake to <laughs> that music for 20 plus years and seeing your interpretation was mind blowing to me to be able to hear notes and things in a completely different way. Yes. What was that like for you? I mean, had you seen Swan Lake enough to where you 
the, the, the traditional classic versions where you knew the choreography? Like, was it hard to hear the music differently or did you not know it well enough that it wasn't even in the way? No, I mean, I spent quite a lot of time just listening to the music before I did Swan Lake. Um, and I was very familiar with the choreography because I'd seen it a, a couple of times. So then I knew that um, in my work, I had to reference, um, you know, just so that you make it accessible for everybody, the ballet audience, uh, the contemporary dance audience, just yeah, so that everybody can come in there and watch a thing and go, oh, now I understand that, you know, because I think a lot of the time people shy away from ballet, especially here, because they go, I, I don't understand what it's about. So then I made it my responsibility to make sure that people understand. So I would take the social issues that are happening around the globe, really, and reference that to traditional South African things that happen, rituals. So I tried to bring that all together. It was amazing to witness it and, and to see it. Um, but when you, th you talk about, you know, social issues being a big part of your creative process, yeah. let's talk about what that social issue is that you're addressing in your version of Swan Lake. It was really strange because I did not know how it was going to pan out, obviously. Um, so I remember the first day of rehearsal, I had tutus out in the studio for the women initially. And I went out the studio, I came back and all the men were in tutus. A lot of the time, yeah, I don't, I don't plan things, you know, it's just I come back and they're in tutus. And I thought, OK, well, that solves my costume problem. Um, skirts and dresses, they look really good on men. And then in terms of Odette and Odile, I was definitely wanting to interrogate the, that misconception that men who dance are gay. And I think that with the men that I work with, uh, some of them have worked on point. And so I thought, OK, let's have a, an Odile who is a man who falls in love with Secrete and let's see how it changes things. And as it turns out, it doesn't change anything. I mean, OK, I suppose it becomes a little bit political, but, but that was not... Um, what I was trying to do. What I was trying to do was acknowledging the fact that there are men who dance on point and do it beautifully. And I wanted to give them that platform to be able to do it, yeah. It's so incredible and I love the way that evolved so organically. The dancers in general were not on point though, right? Throughout the Swan Lake, they were all- No, it was just ordeal. I, I absolutely love that. I think it's so fascinating. Yeah. You definitely talk a lot about androgyny and yes. how important what gender is in dance. How does that shape your creative process or do you just kind of let it flow and happen organically like you did with Swan Lake? Um, what Giselle, I mean, I wanted a murta that was tall and graceful and beautiful. And it was just so interesting to put him in that role and just let him run with it. And the audiences would go, Where's that woman? You know, the tall woman that, <laughs> that dance murder? I want to blur the lines. I want to break down the barriers. I don't want it to become male, female. You know, I want us to just come together and, and sometimes just confuse the people a little bit. Why do you feel a need to tackle existing works, existing ballets and make them your own? Where does that come from? I think it comes from the love. I love ballet. Um, I just, you know, I didn't become a, a ballet dancer, but I really do love it. And I love the music and um, I respect it a lot. And I think that telling narratives is very important to me because I, I myself don't like going to the theater and watching a work. And then afterwards I'm thinking, what was that? Um, and I think that sometimes, especially with narrative, you have to be so literal to to get people to understand what you're saying. So, you know, that's why I'm drawn to the narratives and I'm drawn into them because also um, I can play around with different themes, still using the, the, the classical. And um, yeah, it's not easy because you know that, okay, they're going to be the purists who are going to be going, what are you doing? You know, um, but I think that they started to warm up a little bit and um, they're just going, okay, there's the traditional one and then there's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're definitely ahead of your time in terms of, you know, the conversations that are so important and um, are really being aggressively like tackled right now, especially in America after, you know, the death yeah. of George Floyd. How does that affect the ballet world? Um, and how yeah. does that affect dance and the conversations we need to be having in a real way? And then the conversation has turned to 
whether or not we continue doing a lot of these classics and right. uh, do we try and make adjustments and kind of create yeah. a, you know, change what the intentions were or do we just create new works? Is that something that you're thinking of when you're recreating or you're just being creative? It's not about um, changing the narrative of these story ballets, but just your own twist on it. It's definitely about a twist, but it's also just about wanting to to challenge myself in terms of going, okay, I want to talk about homophobia using Swan Lake, or, you know, I want to talk about domestic violence and rape um, using Carmen. So it's my responsibility to know what is going on around me. And I think that with society, a lot of the times, um, people turn a blind eye. Um, they go, if it's not, if that thing is not affecting me, then I'm just going to sweep it under the carpet. It's not my problem. And I think that with a lot of the works that I do, I'm trying to open up a dialogue. I mean, I'm trying to, to question, I'm trying to go, is there a solution? Can we sit down together and talk about this? So like, what was your experience of racial diversity in dance? Like, were you surrounded by um, a lot of people that looked like you? Like, what was your introduction in terms of like ballet to, to race? With South Africa, we've got a black majority. Um, my grandmother always used to say people are people, you know, so I never grew up having this race thing. What's so incredible about that, you know, being American and having um, a very different relationship with race yeah. and uh, my yeah. experience in ballet being literally the only brown face <laughs> for most of mm -hmm. my training. I think there's something that's so powerful about your journey because I feel like it yeah. allowed you to be you and it allowed you to you know, simply think of yourself as a creator and mm. as an artist and mm. as a dancer and as a choreographer mm. without mm. all of these outside sources that are interfering with your creativity. So, I mean, I'm sure that has a lot to do with your freedom of expression, which I think right. is, is, right. is so incredible. It's been an interesting journey. Um, I, I love doing it because I'm just, just challenge after challenge after challenge. Um, and with choreography, waking up at three in the morning because you've got an idea and I've got to jot it down so that I don't forget it. Um, lots of crying as well. <laughs> it's like, I can't do this. I can't do this. So, yeah. Oh but, my gosh. This is a funny story. This is what I do pretty much every night before a performance um, when they call the five minute. And I become so nervous that I think the door's there. I could just, I could just bolt. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> And it's weird because I thought that with age, I would become less nervous, but no. Oh, it's nervous. the opposite. Yeah, it's really, I'm just like, what do you mean? Like shaking and uh, like, when is it going to end? But I suppose I know that when, when I stop becoming nervous that, okay, it's time to stop. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's just a, a different understanding of your responsibility the older you get. Yeah. And so you feel the yeah. different pressures. But I've definitely been, I remember being in the corps de ballet, specifically of Swan Lake. I mean, it's one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life is dancing in the corps de ballet and in that, in that ballet in particular. But I, I definitely had moments where I was like, I could just walk off the stage. I am in right. so much pain, like yeah. pain I've never experienced. You're standing in what, you know, still for <gasps> like several minutes at a time. You have sweat dripping in your eye. Your feet and your <laughs> butt are cramping. Yeah. And the prima ballerina is just taking her time bowing and you can't switch <laughs> legs until she's left the stage. And there have been so many moments where I was like, I'll get fired. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. I'll just leave yeah. the stage right now. <laughs> but how how are you able to be in that position for that long? I mean, I, I think that was probably one of the hardest things, actually. Yeah. yeah. To go from, you know, as you know, when you think of the start of Swan Lake, the entire first uh, however many minutes is spent jumping. You come onto the stage, the first thing you do in the second act is ton levé en beauté, ton levé yes. en beauté. You're doing pas de chaz, uh, and you go from all of that to just stopping. Like that's just not yeah. even healthy for your body yeah. to do that. Yeah. And I think that dancers have this, um, you know, in in just loads um, is the the mental the mental strength and something that we would do um, on on the side. I was I'm the shortest one, so I was 
always the leader in the front of the line. Um, and we right. would slowly, like very quietly, of course, not to disturb anyone dancing out in the center, um, but we would hum like collectively together. And yeah. it would take your mind off of the pain. Wow, that's incredible. It was almost incredible. like, yeah, this- um, That's incredible. This, this uh, like trans like state that you all are in mm. together. And I think that's something wow, that- that's amazing though. Yeah, it's one of the like, the things that I think are so incredibly important um, to acknowledge um, yeah. that ballet does and can do is like bring you together in this um, this other sphere um, that's not often talked about when you when we when we you know discuss what ballet yeah. is it's it's always like some mean Russian teacher yelling at a thin white girl <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, Missy, I want to know, what was it like for you being the only African-American woman in the ballet company, you know, because, yeah, I suppose ballet is like mostly white people do it. So how did you feel? I mean, did you fit in or were there some challenges there? When I first came into, into ballet, my teacher was a white woman yeah. who wanted to create opportunities for children that wouldn't be exposed to it. So a lot of those children were minority um, children and I was one of them. And you know, she had children's uh, parents remove them from the school um, when she started giving me leading roles. Uh, parents that were on the board of directors that were funding the school and the performances yeah. that stepped down. And all of that was kept from me. You know, she really right. had an understanding of um, my development process and that if I had that looming in the back, then it would, you know, definitely take away from my experience, how I felt about ballet and how I felt I fit in and, and could succeed. Mm. So. Though I was very aware of, you know, what it meant to be Black in America, right. when I stepped into ballet, it was like all of that went away, which is yeah. the opposite for a lot of Black Americans that go into ballet. Yeah. They feel it even more intensely um, when they step yeah. into a room full of all white people <laughs> and are being yeah. told, you don't have the right skin color, body, your feet are too flat, your right. butt's too big. Right all of those yeah. things. But yeah. for me, it was different. I felt really safe and supported in, in the environment when I was training. But once I became professional, everything completely changed. And right. again, you know, it's it's a lot to take on when you, you know, I moved to New York City, which is such a diverse place. And I'm right. expecting to have that experience. Um, but right. the majority of my days are spent locked up in a studio with all white people. <laughs> so it's not, it's not quite, you know, the New York diverse experience I was expecting, but it took a yeah. toll on me emotionally and psychologically. Yeah. It's like this yeah. thing that's constantly, you know, whether it's, it's said out loud, you know, these subtle remarks or whatever it is, feelings you get that you don't belong. If they wanted black and brown people to be in this company, there would be black and brown people in this company. Right. But of there course, was something yeah. within me, I think, that made me feel like, no, like I, I know I have a bigger purpose and I know that I'm meant to be here. I know that I'm meant to be a dancer and I have so much to say and to share. And that, that was bigger than all the negativity that I was getting. And of course it was because I had an amazing sport, support system right. and right. incredible yeah. black women who uh. maybe didn't completely understand the ballet journey, but they understood what it was to be the only and to be the first. And yeah. to have that type of support, it was night and day for me. Like had I not had it, I don't know where I'd be. I probably would have quit dancing. I probably would have left ABT, but you know, that's why it's so important. I think for women like us to have these conversations, to be yeah. able to be, uh, representation and also just to have the you know what what can be a difficult conversation for a, a lot of people um i just yeah. think it's it's so powerful and, and important i wanted to ask you which is your favorite ballet to dance mm. i i have so you know it's it's just again it's so fascinating that your that your love of ballet and your love of the classics and um you know, that that is what I was also drawn to, um, the music, mm -hmm. and also feeling like I'm a part of something, like yeah. the history of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think especially as Black Americans, we don't really have a history. We don't have a rich history. We don't have, right. you know, it's it's very complicated, our yeah. history <laughs> and yeah, as a yeah. people. And there was something about ballet that I felt like 
oh, I'm a part of something and I can connect this long lineage of dancers and the way it was created. And it gave me like a sense of, of family and purpose in a right. way that I don't yeah. think I'd ever uh, experienced it. My favorite ballet is Romeo and Juliet, but I love Swan Lake too. I think there's just a lot of trauma around it. Yeah. And I wish yes. that I didn't have that. It was yeah. one of the first ballets I did as a professional. Um, I was mm -hmm. one of the four swans when I first joined ABT as an apprentice. But then, you know, years later to have the experience of being pulled from you know, the white, the white acts um, while they were yeah. filming it was kind of the beginning of my trauma of like, you don't Bro. belong here. And then being cast as Odette O'Deal, the first black woman um, in ABT's 80 year history to have that opportunity. Yes. And then just the backlash. It's not even like, oh, well, you, you know, you shouldn't be up there, you're black, but taking digs at whether it's technical, just like things that I knew were connected to my race, but they weren't saying right. it, as to why I shouldn't be doing this role. That, you know, it was the first time in my entire life as a dancer that I'd experienced fear and nerves on stage because there was just so much around Ugh. whether or not I deserved to be doing it, whether or not I would ever become a principal dancer if I've messed up in any way, technically, that that was proof that me, a black woman, shouldn't be doing ballet. <laughs> Stay in your box. <laughs> yeah. Stay in your box. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And it's taken a lot to kind of push through you know, I have like triggers when I hear certain parts of Swan Lake where I'm like, oh my God, oh my gosh, that, you know, yeah. that I don't want other dancers to have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so beautiful that you don't, <laughs> that yeah. you, yeah, I think it's absolutely incredible yeah. that you can come in and, and recreate your own, you know, the way you hear it and just allow that pure, yeah you know, beauty to wash over you and allow you to explore and create. I think it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's also, I do the classics because I want to celebrate them and I want people to know that I respect them. What does Giselle mean? Like, what does that story mean to you? Like, emotionally and like from a, a narrative you know, perspective, like what does Giselle mean to you? Um, she's very layered, a little bit fragile, but I didn't want to make her fragile. You know, I think she's she's trusting, she's innocent, um, she's beautiful and a little bit naive as well. You know, so I when when I did Giselle, I'm 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 not that girl. I'm not that frail innocent girl. I, I, so I wanted to find a balance between that, making her frail and fragile and trusting, um, and, but also give her a sensuality, you know, so, so that she's not just this, uh, she's going to fall apart. And then also what I wanted to do in the second act, I wanted to give her power, I wanted to empower her so that we're not left with another woman that, that goes down, you know. And, uh, and I think in terms of the story, when I was talking to the company and we were talking about um, Albrecht, is that we thought that Albrecht has done this before. You know, she has broken a lot of hearts. So when it comes to Giselle, it's, like, oh, it's just another one, which is why I changed um, the ending that, um, yeah, she kills him. <laughs> Revenge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In society, we're taught to be submissive and, you know, you are in the kitchen, barefoot and pregnant. Um, so I just wanted to, to empower women, go, you know, don't shy away from, from your power. I mean, for me, women give birth. That is the most powerful thing um, that a woman can do. So, yeah, it's just taking the power back. Yeah. It's nice to hear your thoughts on the on the characters. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that I've had to, especially the older I get, the more mature I get, and and my understanding of, um, you know, just my my positioning and place as a black ballerina, tackling these roles that were not mm -hmm. created for a black woman. Um, what yeah. what they what they mean, and you know, a lot of my research, like for instance, when I have done Giselle. Um, that I've worked with a theater coach and really 
digging into these characters and finding, you know, mm-hmm. your own way to interpret it, of course, within the confinements of doing a traditional classical work that you can't change the choreography to. But it's it's nice to hear, you know, the way you interpreted her, because I felt very similarly. It's going deeper. And um, though I love to watch former dancers do certain roles, I think it's really important to know, you know, what's been done, someone else's interpretation, what you want to do, what you like from that, what you don't like. But I think with with Giselle, there's deeper issues there that again, yeah, yeah. she's not just kind of this dumb little girl <laughs> that is easily, you know, influenced. I think that she's um, almost made a concerted effort to be blind yep. to a lot of things so that she can exist in this world of like make believe in romance uh, i think that it's it's a cool thing to challenge what mm. you're told you have to do when approaching these certain characters right. um and, and a lot of dancers don't have that support to even go there when diving into a, a character that's been done by so many incredibly famous dancers but yeah i love i love hearing your interpretations with a lot of the works that I do, it's it's also just about where you find the character um, in different parts of your body. I did Lady Macbeth and I, I mean, that was my favorite role to dance. And to find that madness, that really, really edgy um, energy, um, and then to go to Juliet, who is just graceful. I mean, I feel that, you know, we were talking earlier about the conversations of whether or not we we rework these existing classics or we just kind of start all over and have a a different viewpoint in the storytelling. I think that what you're doing is so extremely important and vital. Hmm. Please come to the U.S. <laughs> and and you know I think to to be able to bring your perspective. First of all, it's going to inspire and motivate an entire generation to feel that it's okay. Yeah to yeah. do that because I think that's one of the, the biggest things like within classical dance is this kind of fear of, you know, of creativity for like the next generation that they can't touch certain things and they can't make changes to certain things because it is tradition. And, um, you know, when I hear that word tradition connected to ballet, a lot of, to me, I hear racism. <laughs> I really do. Right. Like it's, it's, um, yeah. it's, it's an acceptable and subtle way of excluding people, you know, by right. saying this is just what we've always done. And this is just tradition. Yeah. And I think that you're really setting an example. And it's one of the many things that we need to do to make changes, you know, coming at it from tackling mm. existing works and giving choreographers like yourself and dancers like yourself an opportunity to have a voice and make some sort of progress. I mean, I think that it's really important for us to carry on fighting because it's a constant struggle, you know, to to be able to be heard. But if we come together um, as dancers and choreographers and we speak with one voice, um, there can be change, you know, but I think that Again, if you have a vision and you know what you're doing and you know where to go, then um, then just go for it, really. This is just the beginning, but having this conversation with you, I think, is, um, is such a beautiful and empowering thing, mm-hmm. especially for the youth to be able to yeah. witness. Uh, what a privilege it has been to chat with you today, Dada. Your incredible journey has been just beyond inspiring. Um, And I hope that we will meet, um, hopefully while you're here in the US performing or creating. (laughs) Um, But thank you so much, Dada. Um, And I have to also thank all of you watching for tuning in to the Music Center's Inside Look. 